Hi, everybody. I'm Lily Gonzalez, and I'm glad you're joining us for Milo Imagines the World. Thanks to Matt de la Peña and Christian Robinson. We're going to travel on a subway with Milo and his older sister, and we're going to daydream a little bit with Milo. Matt de la Peña has won lots of awards for his wonderful books, including the very special Newberry Medal for Last Stop on Market Street. His newest book is Milo Imagines the World. Illustrator Christian Robinson received a Caldecott honor and a Coretta Scott King illustrator honor for his art in Last Stop on Market Street. He writes and illustrates many other picture books. I hope you enjoy imagining the world with Milo. Hello, San Antonio Book Festival. We're so thrilled to be a part of this. I am Matt De La Pena, an author. Hey, and my name is Christian Robinson, and I'm an author and illustrator of picture books. And we're thrilled to be here to share our brand new book. It's called Milo Imagines the World. So maybe I'll read the book to you first, and then Christian will talk about how he went about making the art. All right, so I will share my screen. And here's a cover of the book. Um, and this book is fairly new. It's only been out a couple of weeks, so we're very excited to share it with people. Hello. I wanted to start by inviting everyone out there to look at this picture and just in your mind, form a couple observations such as, who are these people? What are they doing? Where do you think they are in the country? Um, do you notice that there are little metal spirals in the middle of this picture? I, I wonder why. We're gonna come back to this picture later on and my hope is that you see it in a deeper way at the end of our talk. I should also share with you that this isn't the first book Christian Robinson and I have ever collaborated on. We previously have worked together on Last Stop on Market Street, which you see right there, the orange book, and Carmela Full of Wishes. So this is our third book together. All right, that brings us to Milo Imagines the World. I'm gonna read it to you. Um, I do wanna tell you one thing, when you read a picture book, you read the words, of course, but you also read the pictures. So I invite all of you to really look at the pictures and read the story that's in the pictures. So here's Milo and his sister ducking down into the subway. What begins as a slow distant glow grows and grows into a tired train that clatters down the tracks. A cool rush of wind quiets into a screech of steel. And when the doors slide open, Milo slips aboard. The train bucks back into motion as he and his sister squeeze onto bench seats. The whiskered man beside Milo has a face of concentration. A businessman has a blank lonely face. The wedding dress woman near the far door has a face made out of light, while the dog peeking out of her handbag has no face at all, just a long lolling tongue. These monthly Sunday subway rides are never ending. And as usual, Milo is a shook up soda. Excitement stacked on top of worry, on top of confusion, on top of love. To keep himself from bursting, he studies the faces around him and makes pictures of their lives. At a downtown local stop, the whiskered man folds up his crossword and hurries off the train. Milo imagines him trudging through brown mounds of slush it's a five flight climb to his cluttered apartment where he's greeted by mewling cats and burrowing rats. Parakeets tweet songs of longing as the man sips tepid soup hunched over a game of solitaire. Late that night, the door to the parakeet cage mysteriously falls open and the cats gather on the cold sill to watch the birds fly free above the city. Milo tugs his sister's sleeve and holds up his picture. 
But even when she turns to look, he can tell she doesn't see. She's a shook up soda too. A boy in a suit boards the train with his dad. His hair is a perfect part and there's not a single scuff on his bright white nikes. Milo imagines the clop, clop, clop of the horse-drawn carriage that will carry him to his castle. Imagines the clink, clink, clink of the guards slowly lowering the drawbridge. Across the human-made moat, the boy is met by a butler, two maids, and a gourmet chef offering crust-free sandwich squares. He's living a very fancy life in Milo's head. Milo flips to a fresh page at a bustling midtown stop. When the wedding dress woman strides off the train, a band of street performers launches into Here Comes the Bride and everyone on the platform stops and cheers. Milo imagines the grand cathedral ceremony where the couple will be pronounced husband and wife. Imagines the groom whisking his new bride to an awaiting hot air balloon where the pilot loads them in with blankets and blasts the heat. And up, up they go, hand in hand, beyond the concrete walls of the city into the infinite blue. Milo holds up this picture too, but his sister shoos him away. Can't you see I'm playing my game? He watches her thumbs bang around her smudged screen, then turns back to the boy in the suit. They lock eyes for a few long seconds, and suddenly it feels like the walls are closing in around Milo. The spell is broken, when a crew of breakers bounds onto the train announcing, you all ready for a show? Several curious faces look up as the beat drops. And now the girls are walking up walls. They're whirling around poles. They're backflipping over shopping bags. When the train pulls into the next stop, they collect a few dollars and scramble for another train. Milo imagines them going from train to train, doing their act as everyone watches. But even after the performances are over, faces still follow their every move when they walk down the electronics aisle at the department store, when they cross into the fancy neighborhood. Milo doesn't really like this picture, so he puts away his pad and turns to his reflection in the window. What do people imagine about his face? Can they see him reciting his volcano poem to the class? Can they hear his mom's soothing voice reading him a bedtime book over the phone? Can they smell the chili Colorado bubbling in a pot in his auntie's apartment near the cemetery? Butterflies flood Milo's stomach when it's finally their stop. He follows his sister onto the cold station platform and up the stairs. Above ground, he's surprised to see the boy in the suit a few paces ahead. He's even more surprised when the boy joins the long line to pass through the metal detector. Milo's sister suddenly bends to give him a hug. I didn't mean to snap at you, she says. She takes his hand, adding, you have your picture ready? He nods, feeling the warmth of her fingers. As they slowly shuffle forward, Milo studies the boy in the suit, his dad rubbing his thin shoulders. And a thought occurs to him. Maybe you can't really know anyone just by looking at their face. Milo tries to reimagine all the pictures he made on the train. Maybe he could have done it like this instead. Maybe the whiskered man wasn't going home to a lonely apartment, but there was a family waiting for him. Or this, maybe Milo had it all wrong who this wedding dressed woman was going off to marry. 
or this. Maybe one of the girls lived in the nice neighborhood in the fancy new building and the doorman isn't shooing them away, but welcoming them home. Milo's chest fills with excitement when he spots his mom through the crowd. His sister rushes to give her a hug before pulling Milo in too. And it's in this tight tangle of familiar arms that he feels most alive. When they separate, Milo flips through his pad until he finds the right picture. I made this for you, he says, holding it up. And he watches for the smile he hopes will spread across his mom's face. And our book ends with the audience, the reader, getting to see the picture that Milo made, especially for his mom. And you may recognize this from the beginning of the presentation. This is the picture Milo made for his mom. But now I think we see it differently, right? We know who these people are. We know why he's drawing a picture of them together on a stoop where they live. And now we know why the metal rings are in there because this is Milo's picture in his notebook. So thank you so much for letting me read, to the, read the book to you. And now I turn it to Christian and we get to hear about some of the art. Hello everyone. Um, so it is so good to be with you all <laughs> um, at the San Antonio Book Festival. Um, and what I wanna do is just share a bit about how I go about making the pictures that you see in the book. Um, so I'm curious if anyone out there likes to draw or to make pictures, a few of you, yeah. Well, I love to draw, I've loved to draw for as long as I can remember to love make, I love to make pictures and make up stories. Um, and I think one of the things that I really love most about drawing is, <clears throat> well, something you might not be able to tell about me just by looking at me, is that I'm actually a very anxious person. Like I get really overwhelmed and I get nervous and really scared if I have to like get up in front of a lot of people and talk or, you know, just randomly sometimes I get really anxious. But one of the things that helps me um, is my work as an illustrator. Because when I illustrate, I have to sit down and I have to focus on what is right in front of me. And it's usually my desk um, and whatever art materials I'm working with. And I feel super lucky that I have a, <clears throat> a place to create and make stuff. I have an art studio. Um, and yeah, that's me when I was little creating and drawing, same thing I do today. Um, and this is my art studio. As you can see, I love to surround myself with images and objects and things that just inspire me and give me ideas. Um, and make me happy, really. Um, so here's actually a little clip of my art studio. So most days when I'm not doing Zooms, <laughs> I you know, like to get up early, not too early, of course, um, and head to my studio, which is actually the garage right behind, right behind my house. So basically I turned a place where people usually park their car um, into a place to make stuff. Um, so I get up some mornings and I, and I go and I grab my materials and I usually have some tea or some water. Um, and I usually sketch things out, whatever project I'm working on. Um, and I like to put things on my walls, usually the projects that I'm working on at that time. Um, so I can get a better idea of how the, the story I'm working on is coming together. Uh, and so, yeah, this is my happy place. This is my studio. A little backstory. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. Um, that's me when I was little. It's me and my mother. Although, you know, this is actually one of very few photos I have of me and my mother growing up. That's because I wasn't actually raised by my mom um, or my father. Uh, my mother, she struggles with addiction and mental health and was in and out of prison for most of my childhood. Um, but I was very fortunate to have a grandmother who was my caregiver. Um, my grandmother, she's the lady, they're all wearing yellow, but she's the lady in the yellow with two kids in her lap. She's right next to an aloe plant. Um, she was a caregiver, not only for me, but for my older brother, two cousins of mine, my aunt, and we all live in this tiny one bedroom in LA. 
And looking back, I realized that drawing and making pictures was my way of creating space for myself because the, the apartment was kind of cramped. Um, but I can create whatever kind of world I wanted to see on a piece of paper. Um, and also, if you pay attention to this picture, you can see a little VHS collection in the background. If you don't know what a VHS is, it's kind of like basically a movie, like it's like an ancient antique way of watching movies, um, like Netflix, you know what I'm saying, or YouTube. Um, so Jurassic Park, that was um, one of my favorite films growing up, pretty special, right? Speed, this is a very important action-packed thriller. Um, it may have inspired a book that me and Lat Matt later worked on, Last Stop on Market Street, you see. Um, and Cinderella, right? This movie taught me so much that you can go from rags to riches, that you can get the man if you got the right clothes, you know? Um, there's my Prince Charming. That's my boyfriend, John. He's actually a teacher. He's right now doing some distance learning in the other room on a Zoom. Um, and this is our dog, Baldwin. He is a retired racing greyhound. Oh, there he is again. Oh, one more time. He really wanted to be in this presentation. Um, okay, so making Milo. So in illustrating a whole book like Milo, it can be kind of overwhelming and intimidating because you have to make all these choices and decisions as an illustrator, but it all begins with the author's words. So Matt wrote this story and it's my job to read these words and to use my imagination and to think of a way to visualize all the things that are happening in the story. And I do that by starting small. I work on these little teeny tiny post-it notes, little doodles, um, uh, storyboards. And you can kind of see it's the same story we just read, but just very tiny and not so much worrying about the colors and the design and all that. Um, I'm just thinking about what's the easiest way to communicate what I want to show visually. Um, and guess what? For those of you who raised your hand and said you like to draw, have you ever drawn something and you look at your drawing and you think, this isn't very good. This is not, I'm not happy with this drawing. Well, guess what? I feel that way all the time as an illustrator. This is actually my desk filled with drawings and sketches that I didn't like, uh, filled with mistakes. Um, and I make tons of mistakes. And I know Matt also makes tons of mistakes. And what we do as both authors and illustrators is we kind of have to redo things over and over and over again. Um, and that's okay to make mistakes. Uh, and then I have fun kind of figuring out who these characters are. What, what should Milo look like? I gave him a little green hat and some, some, uh, so, uh, and some glasses. Um, and I think about where they live. <clears throat> what does the city look like? I'm also thinking about what materials I might want to use. So I use some colored pencil on this one. And there's his little, his little glasses, his little jacket. And there's his sister. And yeah, it was so fun to kind of create this world in the city. I looked at a lot of pictures of like the subway system and I've been on the subway a few times in New York, but um, I had to do a bit of research. Um, and it was fun to think of all the people that you see when you, when you ride public transportation, which is what I did growing up, taking the bus everywhere in LA with my grandma. Um, and now I, what was really exciting is I got to illustrate kind of two worlds in this book, right? I got to illustrate the real world that we see Milo um, on in the subway but also the world that's inside Milo's head, his imagination and his drawings. So for his drawings, I kind of used like pencil and crayon and colored pencil. And that is how I made the pictures in this book. So Matt, should we ask each other some questions? <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Oh my gosh. Um, there are a couple of things I was curious about when I was listening to you talk. So you spoke about making mistakes and I bet you there are a lot of kind of young artists out there listening to us right now. My daughter's a young artist and I see her get so frustrated when she's trying to draw something and it doesn't remotely look the way it does in her head. Is there, do you have any suggestions about how young people can sort of deal with that frustration? Hmm. Hmm. Ooh, that's a good question, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. 
So I still am working out how to deal with that frustration. Um, when the thing in your head doesn't show up the way you want it to, um, I think that's just like at the human condition, right? Um, <laughs> but I kind of have learned more and more, the more I draw and the more I create pictures that um, when I try to create a drawing and I try to make it perfect, when I, if that's even a thing, if that's even possible, but when I try to make it like precise and accurate and get the right measurements and use all the right colors, it sometimes can take away from the drawing because I'm so worried about it being just right that I'm not enjoying the process of creating that picture. So what I have to remind myself, and maybe, maybe, maybe this will help your daughter as well, is just that I think you just have fun with what you're doing. I think you just enjoy the process. And I found that when I have fun with what I'm doing, if it's, in, if it's important to you, other people seem to respond better to that thing when I'm just kind of having fun and I'm not overthinking it. Um, and it's, so that can be frustrating too, but um, it's also kind of like a, I don't know, it's kind of a cool thing that you don't have to try to get everything perfect. Well, I think what you're saying makes so much sense because even for us now, this is our job, but we do this job, of course, to make a living, but also because this is the job we wanted to try to do because, you know, like this is fun for us, right? And so hopefully that joy ends up in the books that we create. Um, I know I have this theory that every time I come up with a story idea, that's the best it will ever be when it's just in my head and then when I try to put it into words, it never lives up to that initial idea. But like you're saying, maybe that's okay. Maybe that's like part of the process is kind of falling short or maybe I'm looking at it wrong. Maybe it just becomes something slightly different than that initial idea. I was just curious from an artist standpoint, how you dealt with that. Um, and I have a question for you, Matt. Sure. It's going to be a great question that I, I'm not just making up at the top of my head right now. <laughs> Crazy. Um, my question is for you, Matt, Matt De La Pena, is... <laughs> How do I keep um, my skin like this? Well, it's, it's <laughs> a lot of water. <laughs> um, so we've worked on three books together. Would you say there is a some sort of connecting thread between these books? And, and maybe a second question is, what inspired Milo specifically? Why Milo? Did you, did you just give me a two-parter? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I do think there are connecting threads. Um, I really think if you put the books next to each other, it, there, are, there are more than one connecting thread. So for me, the first thing that comes to mind is public transportation. Even though Carmela isn't on a bus, I believe she rides the bus. Um, so they're walking, right? And they're taking their metal cart to the laundry mat. But I think when they're all going together, I think they're gonna take public transportation. Um, so that's the first one. The second thing that connects them all to me is, I think we both really love to sort of center our stories in neighborhoods like we grew up in. And I think I remember when I was a young writer thinking, oh, well, if you're gonna read one of my stories, YA picture book, you're gonna see moments of grace and dignity that exists on the quote unquote wrong side of the tracks. So that's kind of the way I've always viewed my storytelling is I wanna show moments of grace and dignity in neighborhoods like the one I grew up in, the one you grew up in. So I think that connects them. And then last but not least, I think you see three young people who are, by the way, I'm pretty proud of my answer so far, <laughs> but um, you, you see three young people who are working through things in their head and it's not like they're gonna get it right at the end, but there's a little progress in their ability to sort of think for themselves. So CJ, is starting to try to look at the world like his grandma. Does that mean the next day he's not going to complain? No, but just for this day, he's, he's taking a step in, in an interesting direction. Carmela, she's trying to figure out what her wish is. And throughout the whole book, she's processing like what is important to her. And so at the end, we don't get to see what that is, but the point is she's 
she's thinking through it. And then Milo is drawing the world and he's open to the idea that maybe there's a different way to draw the world. Maybe he should be a little bit more generous with the way he views people. I think that's the way I'd say the, the books connect. Um, what was part two again? And just why Milo, what, yeah. So what I think a lot of people don't realize is that Christian and I, um, we have an odd relationship in, in the, the world of picture book making in that we do communicate sometimes. And Christian, I remember we, we spoke about what we were gonna try to do next so we actually had a conversation. You were actually there the first day the story idea came to me, right? Um, so I think usually the illustrator takes the words and then illustrates the story in and around the words and tells a separate story sort of in, in the same space. Well, this one was a little different because I think you were there at the conception of the story. And so... I think part of it is I thought of art. I thought of the fact that you grew up with a mother who wasn't in your life all the time. And what does that mean? Um, how did you find, like you said, a way to control the world um, it, that was sometimes possibly uh, you felt a lack of control. So I, I thought of those things and I thought of your story when I started to tell Milo's story. Now, I'm sure it it greatly differs from the way you actually grew up, but that inspiration was there from the very beginning of the book, which, as I just mentioned, and you know, Christian, normally um, the, the, the illustrator isn't there unless they're the writer for the conception of the book. So it was kind of a different process. We have a couple of seconds left, Christian, if you don't mind me asking you a question about Milo. Sure. Um, did you feel a personal connection when you were doing the visual part of constructing Milo? Yes. <laughs> um, I feel a personal connection with every story, every book that I work on. Um, you know, these books are commitments. They take me at least maybe four to five months to illustrate. Um, but I think what, what draws me to any manuscript is just um, that I can see myself in there, that I feel it's something missing, something I want to put in the world. So I do make it personal. This book, I had to, I didn't have to work as hard, right? It was, it, it was particularly personal, um, but it was also very therapeutic and just a lot of fun. And I wanted to definitely keep fun at the center of this book because even though I was a child who had these experiences that were challenging, I still gravitated towards joy. And, and you know, I, I had a lot of things and people to be grateful for in my life. and. I'm so grateful for the story that you put into this world, Matt, how the story has so many layers, how it's not just about, you know, being a child of an incarcerated parent, but um, perspective and how we look at the world. And it's just so broad. And I'm so grateful for all the gifts that you brought to this story. Thank you. And I just wanted to end by saying, we're grateful we got to share this with you. Um, say hello to all my favorite taco shops in San Antonio and Please continue to watch the San Antonio Spurs, one of my favorite teams in the NBA. Christian, I believe you're a San Antonio Spurs fan yourself, right? I love baseball. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank so, you, everyone. Thank you all. <laughs> Bye.